significant uh, investments and job growth in these communities in a stark contrast to what they'd experienced over recent decades. Can you give us some examples of the most prevalent type of jobs? Because when I think about manufacturing jobs, I mean, I think about the old days, these well-paid, unionized jobs that sometimes require a skill. What types of jobs are the most plentiful? Uh, in these communities that we're talking about and that have been spurred by the uh, economic... FM 91.7, NPR. Jobs right now Citation. Construction spending and big investment. So the manufacturing jobs will likely come in the future. Um, but right now, it's the construction of these facilities that is, I think, really driving much of the, the growth in these, these areas. Talking about what the Democrats have done versus the Republicans. Manufacturing has traditionally been seen as this, uh, you know, bastion of really good, good wages and good benefits, but that's become less true over recent decades. Um, in fact, some some suggest they're not that much better than um, a fast food job except for when they're unionized. And there they still have the traditional strong wages and good health benefits and retirement package and all of the kinds of things that we consider part of a good job. Yeah, so that's gonna be a real big business going is forward. taking everything well, away from the look of man. These construction jobs, by the way, are- Taking places. everything from the working man. I told y'all. Facilities and infrastructure to repair old infrastructure, also semiconductor manufacturing, clean energy. These are manufacturing facilities for the future. Exactly. And so that's where I take most heart for these kind of initial signs of, you know, manufacturing construction spending going up. But that is going to lead to much greater growth. So the, that's the idea behind these investments in infrastructure it's not just that you're creating jobs building a highway um, but that goods and services will be able to get to market much faster that you're spurring investment and that investments going to be more productive and more profitable going forward and much of the investments are in the kinds of industries that we expect to grow in the future you mentioned the chips the semiconductors the green energy so this is i feel like our country is being set up to do quite well in the future Many of these communities, though, uh, they're solidly Republican. As Talking about African-American communities. About workers benefiting from them. Low-income communities. Basically largely unaware of how their lives have been impacted, specifically by the Biden administration. And you give us this example of Tennessee's Blue Oval City Electric Vehicle Battery Facility. Can you share what you learned about what happened there? Yeah, so I talked to a lot of workers on the site, and this is this very large facility in rural Tennessee, a couple hours outside of Memphis. It's going to be a big electric vehicle, battery and manufacturing construction in an area that had for 20, 30 years really tried to spur investment and nothing had happened. Most of the jobs in, in the area were you know, very low paying. And so I talked to these workers and they'll say, I've got a job doing the construction on the site and this is the best thing that's happened in my life. I used to you know, have to pay half my bills this week and try to pay half the next week. Um, I'm, you know, really was really struggling. I didn't even have a bank account. And now these are people, the same people will tell me, I can take my kids on a vacation. I'm trying to buy a house. I have good credit. So these big steps forward in their lives that you can see from this project, which are good union jobs constructing the big facility. Then when That's I what the Democrats them, are well, doing. How or why? Not the Republicans. This project came to be. Why would you go backwards, America? Many billions of dollars in loans from the federal uh, government as part of these investments we're talking about. It also received significant state funding. And the workers to unanimously said, well, I credit Ford, which is the big uh, Ford Motor Company, as a joint investment there. And then I would probe and push, and they'd say, well, I also credit my union for, for helping make this happen. And I had to keep asking and asking before they would ever mention any elected officials that had anything to do with it but their sentiment was well if any elected official had anything to do with us i would like that and support them but i have no idea 
about this. So I think this suggests one of the key challenges of these kinds of policies will be to understand for workers and the public to understand that there's public policy behind them. Because this isn't the kind of infrastructure, much of it is not the sort of traditional kind where you see this is a highway built by the government, and there is a fair amount of that, but a lot of this is private industry that is choosing to invest because the tax credits and the like have spurred them into action. And so they're putting up a Ford sign, not a, there's no government sign around it saying this was uh, your tax dollars at work. So it's a much harder challenge for workers to make the connections to public policy. But haven't we experienced that before? Why do you think that the message isn't clear? We certainly have done some kinds of uh, you know, tax policy that encourages private investment. But the scale of this is significantly bigger. It's also different because there's much of the funds go through from federal government through states and then the states provide support so it's a it's more complicated that way and then i think the last thing is you have to certainly take in, uh, into effect the much larger political context that's going we've become a much more polarized society and people are more distrustful of information especially information that might go against their prior beliefs and so to convince people that this new uh, funding is is coming from a party that they might not already necessarily agree with is an additional hurdle to overcome. The experience people are having also varies though too, right? I mean, you share the story of some local farmers in Tennessee. Let's not be silly people. It doesn't matter whether you agree with the Democratic Party or not. If the things they're doing are benefiting you and making your quality of life better, why would you not support them over the people that's making life hard for you? I think the more you know, salient question and problem is really about understanding the blame or, or credit attribution. Who, who do you credit for this? And is the economy good enough? Because there's multiple signals that um, you know are conflicting. The biggest ones, of course, are that we have really good unemployment figures, and just their jobs are plentiful now in the economy, about as plentiful as they've been in 50 years. Really good measures, but of course, we had significant inflation, at, you know, 2021 and 2022, and that made people feel poor. Just now, for the past year, their wages have been growing faster than inflation, but it's taking, it takes a little while for that to really sink in that, okay, you know, I felt like I had to hunker down, especially COVID hit, and then my inflation hit, and they're just now sensing that perhaps their incomes are, are and they really are doing better, and, I, and that, there's this, this lag effect that I think is also going to be important to, uh, for people to understand how they're actually doing financially. There's also uneven recovery overall right because I'm thinking about places like Flint Michigan for instance uh, which lost I mean tens of thousands of jobs during the Great Recession and so it's seen job growth over the last few years but it really has yet to recover fully how common is this story around the nation especially in these left-behind counties and I think it's it's the story in lots of communities that have been left behind they suffered decades and decades of challenges and just a couple years of growth is not enough to overcome those barriers that they've been facing and that one other thing that's i think important to note about this sort of uh, growth in these left behind communities is it's a big shift from where they were recently but it's about what's happening in the rest of the country. So the whole country is starting to see these big uh, gains in jobs and, and investments. Um, but what's new here is that it's also going to these other communities that traditionally were not getting things. So it's hard to believe that this is really going to uh, latch on. But what I, the signs I see that it is going to take and that people should be more optimistic than I think they, they are at this moment, is other kinds of things. We have big boosts in new business startups. So the investment's going in, and you see the big manufacturing plant, but then there are lots of other businesses starting nearby. And that's happening across the country, but also in left behind communities. So I take that as a, a, a sign of potential future growth. Also, I mean, many of these priorities 
of the Biden administration, clean energy, for instance, they're not Trump priorities. So, I mean, how would a future Republican administration actually impact these initiatives? Well, there are signs that a lot of the, the kinds of policies that have been pushed that have created these investments would go away. Um, for example, the House of Representatives, controlled by Republicans, has voted on many occasions to repeal um, and eliminate these kind of tax incentives that have encouraged uh, these green energy investments. So that's one thing. There's also signs of, um, in Project 2025, which is this uh, playbook for a, a second Trump administration that former Trump officials are, have put together and there's sort of banning of the word climate change potential in there. There's a, elimination, suggesting also elimination of all of these kinds of policies. I also think there's a big difference in, so President Trump claimed to be a supporter of infrastructure investments, the kind of roads and bridges that um, were in the Infrastructure Act that President Biden was able to pass. So there's also, even when there's a similar direction, there's the quality of, of what actually happened. Um, and it's clear that, you know, Biden actually got this, this stuff passed and, and done. And so even when, when there's sort of similarities, there's real differences in the implementation. Let's take a short break. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the resurgence of manufacturing jobs in America with the American Worker Project at the Center for American Progress Senior Fellow, David Madlin. We'll continue our conversation after a short break. This is Fresh Air. All right, people. Just like I said, I don't know why, after getting ahead, you would want to go backwards. If you put the Republicans back in power, the only thing that's going to happen is left behind. You hear they're calling all the minority areas left behind counties because they left you behind. You don't get the money. No, we're not giving the money to them. That's what's going on. You heard them say it. They didn't say it as plain as I did, but that's what he said. They're purposely doing it. Every time the Republicans are in power, we're getting left behind. And these days, it's not just us, because we're not the only ones that live in those areas, huh? So if you're making under a certain amount of money, Guess what? You're the new N-word. That's how they feel about it. Because they're doing the same thing to you that they've been doing to us for all these years we've been in America. Tax deductions. So the major bills that the Biden administration passed, the Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, did have some requirements for companies that receive government funds that affect job quality, things like prevailing wage so that a company must pay what the market rate is in, in the area and they can't undercut it. And those um, occur on several kinds of funding within all of these bills, but it didn't apply to all of the funding, and there are sort of limits to what these kinds of standards, there's prevailing wage, there's apprenticeship utilization, and the like, but these policies don't guarantee good jobs. They uh, you know, provide an opportunity for them in several sectors, but um, they don't, for example, apply in construction, and they apply in construction, but they don't apply in manufacturing. So what the Biden administration has done is they've implemented the existing policies in the law to the fullest extent, but they also said, well, we're giving out government money and the policy we want to create is our good jobs. And so they have done things like, well, at least provide a plan, you know, asking companies to provide a plan of how they might achieve good jobs. They aren't requiring that, that because they don't have that legal authority, but they are encouraging it and putting their sort of pressure. They've also used the bully pulpit um, a fair 